Good morning. Happy Thursday. I hope that all is well in your home and with your family. I appreciate you joining us for our daily devotion this morning. And once again, we're going to pick up with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as we've done over the past few days. We're going to begin by reading verses 4 through 8, and then we're going to really dig into the text. So let's read together. Let me turn in my Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we will listen to what God's Word has to say to us. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It, keep, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. God's Word tells us that love always trusts. Some translations say love always believes. The Greek word here is pistiu. Pist and I, I was glad to learn what it meant because for years I'd been lulled into thinking that, that, uh, that trusting or believing meant you had to have a trusting attitude towards others, that you gave people the benefit of every doubt. I once read a pastor who was talking about this particular verse of Scripture, and he said that uh, uh, trust means a willingness to be overly generous rather than overly suspicious. Well, all those things are great. There's no problem with any of those things. In fact, they're very helpful for maintaining healthy relationships with others and, 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 and all, maintaining harmony in the church. But there was always this nagging doubt in my mind that told me that God was trying to tell us something more important than that. Well, I learned that He is. Pistiu literally means to be persuaded of, to have saving faith, to trust in God as able. Isn't that awesome? Think about where faith begins. It begins with God. Faith is not about you loving God. Faith is about God loving you. The Bible says before you were formed in your mother's body, God already knew you and loved you. God's love was so complete that it compelled him to develop a plan of salvation, a plan that would let you become, come to know Christ and to be able to spend eternity with God in heaven. Look, you're a sinner, just like I'm a sinner. But for some reason known only to him, God acted in a way to save you from your wickedness and sin. Romans chapter 5, verses 6-11 through 11 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if when we were God's enemies we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Think about this with me for just a moment. How did you discover God's love in your life? Was it because you had some epiphany? A moment where you suddenly, where suddenly everything became clear and you knew that you, you needed a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? No, that's not the way it happened at all. Someone had to tell you that God loves you. Someone had to care enough to show you the Bible verses that, 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 that will allow you to, to come to know Christ as your Savior that prove God's love for you. Some, the Holy Spirit, and, and then after those, those Bible verses were shared, those, that person shared that plan of salvation with you, the Holy Spirit had to convince you that what you've seen and heard is true that God really does love you and that you can be saved through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Your part was just to accept what you'd been told, that God's love is real, that God loves you, and that Jesus died for you. Now, once you became a Christian and you were encouraged to grow in Christ and, and to press on towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, you realize that it's... it's um, it's not about obtaining some higher stake of spiritual consciousness. 
And it's, not, it, it's, it's about discovering a little bit more every day what God's love is all about in your life and then sharing that love with others. The Bible says love always trusts. We need to pray that we will have that kind of trust in our life, that trust in God that will change us from the inside out. And then the Bible goes on to say that love always hopes. I love this verse, especially since I learned that the word hope is, trans, is a translation of a Greek word called uh, epizo. Epizo means to wait for salvation, to anticipate with joy and full confidence. You know, one of the problems that the church in Corinth had was something I like to call second coming fever. Second coming fever is what happens when people get obsessed with Jesus' second coming. It becomes the only thing they talk about. It becomes the only thing they want to hear about from the pulpit. It becomes the only thing they want to read about in the Bible or books that they buy at Christian bookstores. In the worst cases, people tune in, turn on, and drop out of society. I mean, literally in history, Christian history, there have been pe- groups of people who've gone out and sat on mountainsides waiting for Jesus to come again. Of course, they always left disappointed. All of that is bad enough, but the real problems come because what, what goes up, when your temperature goes up on second coming fever, eventually it's going to come down. It never fails because God is the only one who knows when Jesus is going to come again. Why can't people get that message? Why, how can something so simple be so hard for people to comprehend? Here, In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible says that real Christian love, epizo, panta epizo, it always hopes. That means that you always remember that Jesus could come at any moment, but his return could also be 100,000 years from now. But we continue to hope in the promises of God and take confidence that what God's Word says is true. Look, the the delay of Jesus' second coming should not be a source of discouragement for you. It should not be a source of frustration or anxiety. Instead, it should be one more reason to rest in the Lord, especially during times like this. Look, someone once described El Pizzo as a confident waiting because of trust in a promise. We need to confidently wait on God to fulfill His promise. John 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. There's the promise. It comes from Jesus' own lips. So are you prepared to practice El Pizzo, to confidently wait because of the trust that you have in the promise of God? The Bible says love always hopes. And then it says love always perseveres. Some translations say it endures all things. The problem with all of that is the English language just doesn't do an adequate job of conveying uh, what the Bible is really saying here. The, 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 Bible, the Greek word the Bible uses here is hupamino. And hupamino is incredible. It means, listen to this, to hold fast to, to one's faith despite trials and misfortunes. Let me, let me repeat that again. It means to hold fast to one's faith despite trials and misfortunes. The idea here is that real Christian love isn't just willing to hang in there to endure tough times. Rather, it actively celebrates trials and misfortunes as an opportunity to grow in Christ and to share Christ's love. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 14 talks about this. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, 
so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If there's ever been a more timely passage of Scripture, I, I can't, I, it's hard to imagine what it might be. Difficult, painful times like this that we're living in right now should not be a source of fear and anxiety for a believer. Instead, we are to rejoice because God will be with us and God will reveal more of His glory in Jesus Christ. That's what this verse is saying. Love always uh, always tr- per- perseveres. You know, some of the worst misunderstandings about the second coming of Jesus have been uh, in American Christianity, to be honest. We, there, in fact, there's a heresy that's go- sort of grown up over the years. People, people sort of begun to believe this. And this heresy says, we don't have to worry about persecution or suffering because when times get too bad, Jesus is going to come again and take us all to heaven. la di da di da Folks, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says as Christians, we should expect to experience opposition and difficulties because of our faith in Jesus. We should expect to endure the difficult times that people face, whether it's a pandemic sweeping the world or it's economic hard times brought on by that pandemic. Nobody is going to be immune. But Christian, real Christian love should cause you to celebrate these hard times by remembering they'll never have the last word on you. They'll never have the last word on anyone who knows Jesus is their personal Savior. Because Jesus' last words are, because I live, you will live also. Real love, real Christian love perseveres. Well, I think I'm going to wrap it up for today. I wanted to share one other thing with you before we close. Uh, It's something I heard. It was about Easter. And I know we're a little bit past Easter, but it's still still something to share. You remember on Easter Sunday when we wanted to be together so much and we had to be in our homes worshiping? We were locked up inside because of fear of a pandemic. Well, someone said, and I'm not sure who said it, but I wish I did. They said that we celebrated Easter a lot like the first Christians celebrated Easter. They were locked up in an upper room because of the fear of Jewish authorities. They were fearful. They were afraid when suddenly they learned the good news that Jesus had been raised from the dead. So as we worship these weeks and can't get together again, think about that from time to time. We're worshiping like the first Christians worshiped, and God surely poured out his blessings on the first Christians, and God will surely pour out his blessings on you and me. Well, I hope that you have a great day today. I hope that you'll tune in Saturday for our next devotion. In the meantime, I want to wish you health and wellness. Please know of my love and prayers. Have a great day.